This webinar series is about transparency in the financial market, about economy, about ethics, law, and what is really going on. The rule of law is a legal principle that says that the law should govern a nation and us actors who live in a nation and the duties and rights we have towards each other. However, we have seen in the last leakages, the last years, Panama Papers, Par Paradise Papers, that various actors have organized themselves through tax havens with rather complex structures and are using very complex financial tools in order to avoid such responsibilities and to maneuver between laws. So how can we interpret and understand complex information about global corporations and their webs of ownerships, including those registered in tax havens? So with us in this webinar, we have Lynn Anker Sørensen. She's a PhD candidate at the Faculty of Law at the University of Oslo. Her current research question is the legal definition of corporate groups and corporate control in the 21st century. Lynn's research is situated in the intersection between corporate law and securities legislation in the EU law at the EU level in order to analyze the current harmonized degree of transparency of multinational corporate group structure. Her research is therefore of significance for regulatory applicability of tax law, competition law and effective financial markets due to the awareness of multinational enterprise as the predominant way to organize economic activity in today's global markets. So Lynn, could you explain to us what exactly is a corporate group? Well, a corporate group exists where you have one company holding control or a dominant influence over another, yeah. which is a legal definition very often based on the, the, agreed, the um, amount of uh, shareholding between one company and the other. So we say that if one company holds above 50% of the shares in another company, then there's a presumption that these companies belong to the same group. However, there can also be contractual agreements that create the same amount of control or amount of dominant positions. And this has been a well aware uh, acknowledgement of group definitions for a long time. But in light of deregulation of financial markets, the actual significance of contractual ties mm. has increased severely. So a corporate group, as from the very simplistic understanding of only two companies belonging to the same group, they can also amount to hundreds and even thousands of what we denote affiliated companies and they can be integrated, working in the same domain of uh, the uh, economic uh, sectors, mm. for example, producing the same car into different companies, and they can be conglomerates, where meaning that one company controls other companies in a lot of different segments in the industry, in the economic uh, sphere. But why are corporate structures becoming so much more complex today than before? Well, complexity is basically a term used uh, to categorize or trying to understand something which we cannot really put into the same boxes as we did before. So it's something that goes beyond uh, how we used to systematize something. And corporate groups today, as from before, has not only become more extraterritorial, meaning a global spread, they have also been uh, more and more taking uh, use of facilitators around the world, which are helping them to create also companies abroad, but also to operationalize the differences in, uh, in legal rules in other countries. Furthermore, the size, the difference of mm. the types of companies that you can include including not only limited liability companies, but using trusts, foundations, occasionally also of those falling outside the scope of accounting regulations, mm. 
so not necessarily part of the disclosed structure, of course also enhances the complex, uh, complexity of uh, the group structure today. Mm. You have tried to systematize this complexity and you suggest six of those as particularly important. Uh, can you say something more about those? Yes, um, the complexity drivers that can be identified in the field of corporate finance, mm. um, they are uh, first and foremost technology, meaning that the um, significant changes we have seen in the development of technology has also had quite severe complexity um, increasing the phenomenon on the financial mm. markets and on corporate groups. And this has been not only as we can see it's as bettering the uh, degree of information that we can receive based on technology, but it's also made possible that you can, uh, that shares, for example, ownership can shift hands in seconds instead of before taking some more time. The second is opaqueness, which is uh, based on financial markets. It's all of these very different financial instruments that is now offered on markets which basically stems from the deregulation of finance in the late 1980s, where the UK in 1986 chose to deregulate its uh, securities market, where the US had to follow up. And this made possible that you could speculate in all sorts of financial instruments before it was much more regulated. Now you can really bet on any future event holding any economic implications. And thereby, a lot of facilitators have then uh, created and still creates uh, financial instruments which are quite opaque, very difficult to understand. And this of course equally holds implications for the control linkages between two companies, which can make it quite difficult to assess whether two companies are actually part of the same group mm. because of the myriad of financial instruments that you can use and hold in between. There is where this contractual part as a linkage factor comes into importance. Mm. The third complexity driver is what has been identified as interconnectivity, the interconnectedness of today's global economic um, life. Mm. Uh, in finance, we've seen this very well illustrated by the global financial crisis, where we saw how banks, how very highly interconnected banks are. But this also goes to the, for the corporate groups from a study from 2008, um, a researcher in Zurich, uh, James Glatfelder, he made a study of what we call cross-shareholder relationships. So he started out by a sample of 40,000 multinational corporate groups, looking into how their relations, interconnected relations are together. Mm -hmm. And based on those 40,000, he found that about, it was about uh, 3,000 or so, that controlled as much as 80% of the world's global economic wealth created by those 40,000 multinationals. And as little as around approximately 300 something controls 40%. This gives us quite severe implications of what we can say the degree of also interconnectivity of groups. And of course on the top list is the international investment banks in conglomerates, uh, but still this is quite representative of what we see uh, as an aggregated global sphere, that um, the interconnection of groups are quite significant. Mm -hmm. The fourth uh, complexity driver is regulation. Mm -hmm. And regulation is something which is, of course, always uh, developing and it's based on the each and every domestic, every, every state holds as its part of its sovereignty, the possibility and um, uh, the power to create their own regulations. Mm. This means that we have various regulations, of course, in each country. And um, not only in are the differences among countries, but there may also be differences within one in the same country uh, of about legal concepts. So for example, the concept of control may differ if we look into a tax law regime versus a competition law regime. So there are high degree of uh, differences in fragmentation, which also goes quite well with the next um, complexity driver, which is fragmentation. Mm. 
And fragmentation is then both within the regulatory sphere, but it's also within the corporate sphere that you have a more cross-border mm -hmm. corporate structure and the usage of different types of legal forms and entities in the structure. That's also a, a matter of fragmentation. And finally, temporality as a complexity driver, meaning that nothing stays the same. So in a corporate group, seldomly, if you study them over some uh, degree of time, you will see that they are changing their structures. Some companies are added, maybe by mergers or acquisitions, or some are also, uh, and then you close some companies, you add some companies, and, um, and same with, le with legislation. It's always changing. So uh, um, what it's used to say about in, in uh, the domain of corporations is said that the competition that kills you never looks like you. So you should always change. And the same goes for the regulators. If you want to regulate uh, the business of tomorrow, then of course it has to change all the time. But altogether, this creates um, a quite um, difficult area to operate for the both of for the corporate actors who are maneuvering but also for the legislators but what are the consequences for our societies with such strong complexity drivers well i would say that uh, first and foremost it's the regulatory applicability it's whether our laws can be enforced as they are aimed to because when things are always changing and the degree of complexity mm -hmm. also questions whether our laws are able to capture business reality. And that may, uh, to some, some extent, it may still be able to capture it, but in others not. And this, of course, if we start to question regulatory applicability in specific fields of law, uh, for example, tax law, then it also has some severe implications for democratic processes because then eventually we run a risk that regulations are only capturing specific parts of our populations or specific uh, companies or types of companies. And the more business reality is changing, we run the risk of actually regulating a fewer and fewer or lesser or lesser part of what the law is actually aiming at regulating. Can you say something more about the actors, the facilitators behind these drivers of complexity? Well, uh, it's important to know that it's not the CEO of a huge corporate group who are the key driver of, of or operationalizer of these complexity drivers. That is the facilitators who uh, who is involved. And these are basically distinguished into what we now trust and company service providers. These are also defined in the money laundering directives in the EU. Mm -hmm. They are law firms, accountants, um, um, accountancy firms. Um, and then you have the securities intermediaries, which is basically the banks. And these intermediaries, specifically the uh, trust and company service providers, they are uh, doing a, a lot of different things. They are helping the companies to be compliant in the regulatory regimes they're operating within. That goes for the activity they're doing, but also for just for the establishment of the, the legal form they have established. If it's a limited liability company, it has corporate law requirements of uh, what you need to um, do from uh, on an annual basis to be able to maintain that corporate form so they can help out facilitating all of these things but they're also helping in uh, finding the also the best location for the specific activity that you are going to engage in mm -hmm. whether it's in you want to create an internal bank in your corporate group they can give you advice where to locate that um, they can advise you on uh, the regulations in Bangladesh if you want to enter into the textile industry for production and so on and so forth. The same with the banks, they will, of course, they are crucial uh, facilitators in the, in the world of global finance because they are, of course, providing uh, finance to, uh, to the corporate operations. Even though uh, we see also quite a lot of the internal banks creating a lot of the same facilities as the external bank, the typical security intermediary would mm -hmm. provide. Mm 
So if we look to some of the world's biggest corporate groups, they will very often hold their own internal bank, which will then act as, an, uh, as a security intermediary itself. But of course, without being uh, covered by banking regulations, both because of where it's located and also because it's only you know, providing the services uh, internally. And all of the leakages that we've seen, uh, Swiss leaks, Lux leaks, Panama Papers, Paradise Papers, they've all shown the significant use of tax havens to achieve their purposes. And what roles or which driving force is the tax havens itself in this complexity? Uh, well, the tax havens, it's not so much about uh, the degree of or the level of taxes, which, uh, which is, has been the main problem, if you can say it like that, uh, also with these leakages, as uh, has showed. Uh, because the degree of taxes, again, that is a part of each and every country's sovereignty. They can choose it themselves. And the definition of tax havens in itself is a topic of its own. Uh, and uh, especially also in light of the EU debate, we have uh, several tax havens in the EU, mm. um, not covered by a lot of uh, the legislations trying to escape um, the, the implications of tax havens. So it's basically what distinguishes maybe the tax havens we have in the EU and from those uh, that we have uh, that been covered by especially Panama Papers and, uh, and to a certain extent Paradise Papers is the degree of secrecy that we find in these uh, jurisdictions. And the degree of secrecy basically stems from that a country can have a dual system of legislations. So it's one system for the people who are living in the country and doing their business in the company and there's a separate legal regime for corporations and also private uh, or individuals uh, who are only there for uh, keeping their uh, registered office or also uh, as of like having no activity, no economic activity there. So because if you have economic activity, you have to apply to the same rules as the individuals of that country. We often call this a distinction between onshore and offshore legislation. So onshore, everyone is, which is in the country, doing activity in the country. Offshore, those who only have a registered address there or no economic activity at all. So in the offshore uh, part, because there is no economic activity, there is a lesser um, uh, amount of information necessary for the states because there is no economic activity there. So these countries, they basically receive uh, different kinds of fee, registration fee and the opera operative fee uh, for keeping these often com companies, very often denoted uh, international business companies, IBC companies. Um, and because there is no need for the information about these companies, there is a very low degree of uh, requirements for creating ac annual accounts. So very low degree of uh, requirements for actually keeping those accounts as we know it from, for example, Norway. And these parameters makes it very difficult to actually entrench and trying to figure out what kind of economic activity is going on in these companies um, and what is not. And this also holds uh, implications for what we are trying to done on the, do on the international level with the OECD's uh, agreements on the information exchange between company, no, the countries, uh, where also these tax havens have signed up to also then exchange information. And these information agreements, we can, are of course, they can be divided in two. Those upon request, which are the ones we have had for quite a long time. And then we have the ones which were starting to be effective on last year, which is this automatic exchange of information. And the problem with both of them, I would say, is that if you do not have legislatory, if you don't have like um, uh, some foundation in the country of gathering the significant information or the material information as we would say in finance, then an international obligation to find information which is actually not kept at the lower level mm. is worth actually very little.
So even though these tax havens has uh, agreed to these uh, information agreements, which also makes them uh, obliged at uh, an international level to amend their leg legislation, the question is, will they do so? And what kind of political uh, sanctions do we have if they do not change or amend their laws to be able to capture, for example, information on beneficial owners? Um, so what do we do then? Is this the best sale tricks in the world to show that they still do not comply with these agreements? Or are we able to have some political sanctioning which will be able to, uh, to, um, to make them change their laws? But again, it seems that society still does not get the information that it would need through information exchange agreements. No, and this is of course because of uh, the low amount of information which is gathered mm. in these in some of these countries. And as long as that is still the case, then the information is not stored anywhere. So there is a need, an absolute need, for regulatory amendments to secure the amount of information needed um, f of companies, of beneficial owners, of their financial matters, of uh, intergroup transactions, to, um, and if not that information is secured, then uh, a lot of other regulations cannot be effective as a domino effect. Can you explain to us a little bit more, what exactly is it that is on offer in a tax haven? Well, in a tax haven, uh, it's the, you can say not only the tax havens, but the trust and company service providers um, they will offer you that they can create a, uh, or set up a company for you. Um, they will be the registered address of that company. Very often this is a law firm. Uh, they can offer you in very many jurisdictions to act as the corporate director, meaning that is a representative of the law firm, which is actually also then being the director, which is the one being obliged to keep a record of the economic activity of the company. What is very important to know is that in these jurisdictions that you are referring to, very little economic activity goes on. As I said, the whole uh, rationale for uh, having uh, the offshore jurisdiction or the offshore regulatory regime is that you don't have any activity in the, con in the country. Mm. But these companies, they seldomly are anything else but a holding company, meaning that they're only holding on to shares or the rights or ownership of a building, etc. So it's what we usually can say as passive uh, companies. It's not the operative companies as we are finding in the, which actually are the value creating companies in a corporate group. Mm -hmm. So the only thing they need is basically a registered address, someone to maintain or keeping that those requirements to keep the legal form, very often a limited liability company in order to um, also uh, distinguish the investors from any liabilities related to the company and um, so basically just to maintain it. Mm. But there seems to be this whole industry which is also somehow accelerating in pace. How is this industry of facilitators and actors developing today? What are we seeing? Well, development is always following regulatory developments. So it's, in a way, always about um, being able to hold their own clients compl uh, compliant in the countries they're in. So they will always develop in, in the sense of uh, manorating, in a way, in the regulatory landscape, which is present at any given time. Uh, but development will also come from now we can see the tech revolution which we are in the middle of that also new facilitators are entering the, the market or entering the corporate sphere because uh, for example now more and more companies are looking into how they can make use of or op operationalize blockchain technology for instance in their own structure so not only the banks themselves because this is a fantastic way also to keep information stored. Um, all of the new threats in, uh, in hacking activity, all of these things. So there's always a change in the facilitators. 
on the dem on the supply side. So the demand side will basically be the same, but the supply side will always change based on the development of society and regulations. Hmm. There was um, an economist, prize-winning economist, Robert Schiller. He defined finance as the science of goal architecture, of the structuring of economic arrangements necessary to achieve a set of goals, and the stewardship of the assets needed for this achievement. Can you say something about the division of tasks between what is the finance in this and where does the law come in to play? Well, finance is basically also the, uh, the domain of where corporations are setting their corporate strategy. Where are they going to earn their money and how are they going to make that business as effective as possible? Uh, very often um, looked, looking into transaction costs of the business, making it more and more um, economic effect efficient, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, the law of this is the framework the, um, which is actually narrowing what you can do in finance. So where, where everything can be when you're sitting, uh, having a coffee, and you can discuss how to earn money, how, gonna th how this business is going to be uh, most efficient as possible, then the laws will have to be complied with, which is the, the narrowing factor uh, of what you can actually do in it, which will again differ in each, in each country and differ also based on the legal form you have chosen in a specific country. So well, the laws making this uh, um, the boundaries in a way of finance. So the interesting part that the, the, um, the room between finance and law is where we can find accounting, where we are merging in a way the economic rationality of the company, how they are uh, producing things um, and how they're earning money with the regulations that is uh, uh, limiting uh, how they can do it. Mm -hmm. So then accounting can be seen as the hybrid between the two, where economic thinking meets uh, the legal boundaries. What do you personally think that our governments are doing about these issues today? Well, um, governments can of course always uh, look into how regulations can be amended, of course, trying to um, merge business reality w uh, and mm. the, uh, the, uh, the laws that we have. But which is similar important is that we have efficient enforcement of the legislation that we already have, which is a question in itself and which is also a quite complex question because uh, when business reality is not straightforward and always changing, then very often we are in a situation where we actually do not know whether some of our laws are actually applicable anymore or to what extent they're applicable. So this, and this is actually a very bad thing for both the market actors trying to be compliant, trying to operate in this myriad of new regulations at all time, and uh, and for the uh, for the governments and other regulatory um, assessors uh, to actually be able to uh, to capture well or trying to mm. use the laws on what it's actually meant to do. But what can we as a society? How can we as a society hold? companies to account with, with such a complexity and uh, the limited uh, room for laws to, to deal with this uh, incredible creativity? Well, as a society, I think um, society can divide as, as the government, what they can do. Um, they can, uh, you know, put incentives, they can do uh, regulatory amendments. As consumers, you hold a huge responsibility for yourself in order to be then a responsible consumer if you don't want to be a part of uh, uh, this complexity, which is actually quite difficult uh, just to trace where products are actually actually made uh, and um, the whole life cycle of a product is actually quite difficult to trace, which is uh, one of the key questions in the in the also university-led uh, European-funded smart project. Mm. 
uh, trying to find all of the countries, all of the places where just a, uh, a smartphone is produced and, uh, and also some, uh, some textiles. Mm. So, um, but that is of course a way to go about it, to be an, um, an active consumer. But as a society, we also have one tool to clarify questions, if there are questions to clarify, and that is our courts. Do you believe that we get the necessary clarifications of these questions that these get into our court systems and we get questions clarified? Well, it's again important to understand that there is a selection of cases that enters the courts. So based on the complexity again, um, that cases will be approached in, in the courtroom that is um, sometimes of a coincidental nature. Sometimes it's very straightforward, sometimes of coincidental nature. Um, the whole, in Norway, the Transocean case is a very well known example. The whole reason for that case coming up was because of a tax auditor who were just, uh, as a coincidence, looking over this thing, uh, over the accounts and saying, oh, here's something that is not actually, a, maybe we should look more into this specific uh, transactions. And then it started to, to grow when they looked more into it. Uh, so it's not that these cases by nature is uh, or, or are entering the courtrooms at all. And this is also, of course, because there are quite a big gap in some fields of business reality and the regulatory applicability and, and the regulatory and domains because they're not always looked in, in intersection with each other. Mm. So, um, and then because of this complexity, there is quite a big uh, room for also arguing in both, uh, on both sides on whether our laws, which were made also for diff different types of companies, mm. very, not, very seldomly also for cross-border activity at all. So, is a quite big room for both parties in a case to, s to argue that these laws, they are applicable or not. Mm. So should they be uh, interpreted as following the development in the society they are uh, governing in a way? Mm. Or is this new activity absolutely not covered by these, by the words in this legislation? Mm. And both sides can be heard. Mm. So, um, that is also, of course, a part of uh, of this uh, this complexity, and and also a lo if it's not a criminal case, if it's a um, if it's a third party who is the claimant towards a a, a complex group, then very often th those kind of disputes will be solved in private agreements and through uh, arbitrage. So. Uh, um, so not entering the courtrooms at all and of course this is then uh, decisions which are not public at all so there is uh, no way that uh, any of us except from some researchers that will get information about what actually was discussed in these cases. But what can we do then in your opinion to make financial markets more healthy and more ethical? Well, financial markets in itself, they, they don't have ethics as a specific task. They have efficient allocations of resources as, as their mandate in a way. So, and the two primary aims of the financial markets is to avoid market abuse and investor protection. So, and that is said to be achieved through a perfect degree of information. So information and disclosure are the key factors of efficient financial markets. And uh, which is a debate in itself that we have now increased a quite a lot of our uh, regulations in the aftermath of the financial m crisis uh, because there were then seen uh, quite important loopholes or uh, regulatory lacunas as we call it where there were not sufficient regulations for a lot of the activity going on in the financial markets. Mm. Uh, also very much based on these uh, financial uh, instruments as, uh, as very clever uh, and uh, complex derivatives as uh, shown uh, to play. But 
what has happened in the, in the financial markets to make it more efficient is that we have tried to then increase the degree of information, which is a heavy cost for companies to have to add more and more topics to the reporting agenda. That is a cost. And very often we said that if we are to increase a cost on a market actor, then we should also see some kind of benefit from it. And I would say that my worrying is that more information cannot in itself be the answer because more information also perhaps limits each and every one of us ability to process that information. And in a complex domain, as we are looking into here, trying to select as an investor or as a civil society, trying to select the pieces of information available, putting in into context and trying to understand it to be able to understand whether something as an investigative journalist or as a lawyer uh, to manipulate, uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult. So I would say that the discussion as it been and still is today is that more information is a good thing. I would say that that's not the case. You have to look at it in combination with what we denote as bounded rationality, the ability to process that information so that we ask the material information. What is the information that we actually need? We don't need thousands of pages. You only maybe need one page, but that should be with the significant information that you need to qualify things. When it comes to the ethics, as I started with, uh, that ethic is not a directly part of this. But what we see is that more and more businesses are using ethics or corporate social responsibility as a part of their strategies, as a part of their um, also how they are um, presenting their companies in public and also can be a part of their when companies are entering into investment agreements in companies for example for, uh, for in the extractive industry they can draft and include uh, all sorts of its freedom of contract so they can include um, various forms of also ethical guidelines they can use the OEC guidelines for multinationals they can use the UN uh, business and human rights framework and uh, there has been uh, now in the in the later months also some CEOs raising uh, the concern saying that finance is no longer enough it's no longer enough that your company is earning money the shareholders will to an increasing extent also look to into how you are operating and taking your uh, your social responsibility whether that is still just a gimmick for shareholders or whether that is something that we could uh, actually uh, believe it will uh, create a change still we will still have to wait and see but uh, the field the domain of sustainable investment and sustainable finance uh, is uh, something which we can see in the academic sphere is absolutely increasing mm. we will now open for questions from the students so please, if you can help us. Uh, I was just wondering the, about the internal <coughs> banks because it's, it's something uh, I haven't heard much talk uh, about. What is it and and what kind of regulation do, do they fall out of? And and do you think they should uh, be regulated uh, in uh, more like an external bank, if that's the other term used? And uh, what's the rationale behind uh, internal banks not being regulated by the same rules? Thank you. Um, well, the internal banks, uh, they are basically limited liability companies, which um, can be looked at as, as um, just a finance entity. Um, it's been written about this since the 1980s, 1970s that corporate groups had in their mandates when they uh, established also subsidiaries, often where the production is going on, there is some kind of surplus, some kind of uh, economic wealth that can either be tied to the company, which is how we know it from, from corporate law. That company is an individual separate entity where if it's a surplus that should maybe be used for it could be used to distribute it to the shareholders but it could also be very much used to further develop the production it's which is ongoing but what we see is that from the 1970s 1980s 
there has been a lot of agreements between, and again, uh, basically private agreements, uh, which is still very much used in corporate groups, that saying that a surplus of a company should be distributed to a specific legal entity in, in the group, which is what, in the end, uh, becomes an internal bank. All, when all of the surpluses are said to be distributed to one company, it's because a parent is said to be better uh, able to distribute the surplus throughout the group, knowing where should we invest in more uh, material, where should we engage in new business areas, uh, or also just because there are other companies in the group which are uh, maybe do not uh, run that, that well and need some extra funding for just maintaining. And that, of course, can be used uh, through other legal means as well. But the idea was that if, if the group in itself gather all of the surplus in one entity, there will be also less demanding of external funding. Because, of course, what external funding do is that it creates another sort of control element. It's the same as if you buy a house and you have a huge mortgage on it, you can ask, is it you or the bank who actually own that house? Or at least, who controls it? So it's the same with the groups or any business activity. Sometimes it's good to have external funding. If maybe it's a very risky project, you can, all, you can then uh, isolate it as a limited liability company and it can go bankrupt and not the rest of the part of the group will not be affected at all. So sometimes they can be advantaged uh, for the group. Sometimes it's the internal loans, which also then cre creates a, another sort of control, really. So what has also been done since the 1970s, 1980s, is that they can hold control over other entities, not disclosed as a part of the group, but where they are uh, securing also uh, finance to, to a company, which maybe do marketing material, can do whatever. But they don't have to maybe include it in the group, but they still control it because they, this company is completely dependent on the finances supported by the group. So it's, it can be used as a different means of control. But um, the regulations, is still, it's still used only within a limited liability company. So the regulation governing that company is basically just a limited liability company. And that company uh, where all of the surpluses will be um, you know, stream to will basically be located in a in a country where both for tax you know regulations, but equally important it can be for looking into the investment treaties of that jurisdictions and the tax treaties of that jurisdiction, because what you don't want is to stream your profit to a company where all of the further distributions will be heavily taxed. So the Netherlands, for example, has been. Uh, shown to be a very very um, lucrative, a very uh, good uh, jurisdiction uh, to hold a holding company for investment treaties and also for tax treaties because of the widespread of such treaties. And Belgium, I think, also has, uh, in, the, in the EU. But of course, also, you have the more traditional uh, like tax havens uh, and then we're um, where you can also have these, uh, these IBC companies uh, doing this kind of financing activity in a group. So it's, uh, yeah, but it's, uh, um, in banking regulation, the, these types of um, all en legal entities that are operating as it was a bank, um, but not being covered by banking regulations, are denoted shadow banking. So it's, it's a part of the shadow banking discussion. But that has mostly been done in light of only banking discussion, that you can have entities of the bank, because a bank is a financial group, okay? So it's not one company, it's, a, it's, a, it's the same. So when we talk about multinational corporate groups, that is just the commercial side of it. The banks, they are the financial groups. It's structured exactly the same. So the shadow banking discussion has been much about having legal entities which are outside of the disclosed banking group, which was also something that was shown in the financial crisis, that they could have um, assets which they sold to newly established legal entities 
but because there was no shareholding in the linkage between the bank and the newly established entity on the contracts, they could choose to just keep that entity and all of the assets they sold to it outside of the consolidated accounts. So this made the bank look more solid, making it also less vulnerable to the increasing capital requirements that also came as a, as a result in the, in the years also leading up to the financial crisis. So that this has been discussed in, in the domain of banks, but not equally or similarly in the domain of commercial groups, which is why I'm writing a PhD on the topic. <laughs> Is there any more questions? I can try to make a question. Please. This is really a complex issue, so um, I will try to maybe make a simple question or what um, I wonder about. And is as uh, journalists, if we're going into concrete cases, like to look at corporation, and for instance also uh, investments through the Norwegian um, oil fund, Pensionsfonde, to see the ethics in the in these investments, or how can we find out the um, the um, how the corporations are like the owners, who can be held responsible? Uh, also, like uh, when the Norwegian pension fund invests in different corporation, and we have an ethical council, is it possible actually, as you say, like there is no ethics in finance, or there is not like the the um, yeah, how can we uh, hold uh, government or companies responsible? Is it possible? Thank you for your question. Um, to begin with, um, ethics can how you can hold companies or individuals responsible on an ethical manner. It's a question of which quite uh, what kind of um, requirements have they put on themselves very much. So the uh, the uh, Norwegian um, the oil fund, as we call it, <laughs> um, has put on itself some ethical guidelines. Same with comp corporations. If they include in their articles of association, which is like the constitution of a company, that they are going to follow, for example, the OECD guidelines for uh, for uh, multinationals or the business and human rights guidelines these are directly um, applicable for the company and they can be also enforced in the court of law. So to begin with is to start seeing what kind of uh, responsibilities have this company or this um, as uh, the funds they are uh, is all of these institutional investors they very often have in their mandate some kind of ethical um, requirements that they should follow. So that is the beginning. Map that. H m how much? What? What is this about? And then, of course, looking into the, uh, as is always said, follow the money. See the companies they are investing in. Do they merge with this uh, responsibility that uh, they have taken on up themselves? And that is um, in a in a complex group. The problem is sometimes not only to look at the one company which is directly l linked to the. Uh, to the investment, because that is usually only a part of uh, a bigger pic bigger picture, and this is where the problem of the tax haven sometimes occurs due to secrecy. That it's not only a degree of uh, the private people, the the beneficial owners of a company um, in a, in uh, in Panama. That is the question. Is uh, as significant as the ties to other companies. So, for example, if you're investing in a company in Panama, maybe it's not that evident from us in Norway to see whether that company also is still involved in some weapon um, trading or, uh, or uh, drug cartels or whatever. So, because of the degree of secrecy in these jurisdictions, that is the concern, of course, by having, uh, by having uh, investments through through those countries. However, the debate about how to understand or how to uh, should we then limit investments through any jurisdictions that has that kind of secrecy is very, that is also a cr equally difficult question because very many groups today 
will have at least one, maybe 50, maybe even more holding companies registered in these types of jurisdiction with the um, with high degree of secrecy, not necessarily because they're operating it or taking advantage of the secrecy, but because of their maybe be at some level of time, it will be convenient for them to make use of a tax agreement that the jurisdiction of that company holds. So this is not a black or white question at all and it should never be discussed as that. Uh, it's much more sophisticated. But, um, and about the question about the beneficial owners, of course, um, it depends on whether you are discussing it in terms of tax law or in terms of criminal money laundering law. Distinction there as well. In, in criminal law, if it's some criminal offense, then we're looking into trying to find one physical person who is behind uh, some kind of criminal activity or benefiting from a criminal activity. So that will be if they cannot find a physical person when you're looking uh, in the structure, that will be the person holding the key corporate role in the board of directors. So it's always about finding one physical person. And by default, that will be a board member, typically the leader of the board. But in tax law, then it's much more about looking into whether a financial flow, whether a company in a financial flow can be regarded as a beneficial owner, which has been a debate in the OECD for 40 years, and they are still not, uh, there's still not one consensus about what this term actually means in tax law. Um, so that is still more vague. But, um, but then it's come to say, as also been shown in uh, the latest uh, Transocean case here in Norway, that it's sufficient enough that uh, a company holding on to money uh, for, even though it's a holding company, the only activity is receiving money 13 days and sending it further to Cayman Island, that was enough to be seen as a beneficial owner of those money for 13 days. So it's a very different discussion uh, if it's in tax law or, or more criminal uh, law.